thank you for joining us on this holiday. I'm Eddie Randall. We want to take some time to look back at some of those special and unique experiences and stories we were able to share this year. For many, pride in their heritage begins with their name. Earlier this year, two community leaders in Denver talked to us about the significance their names carry for them. Let's first hear from Representative Iman Judah, Colorado's first Muslim woman to be elected to the state legislature. My name is Iman Judah, and I am the representative of the 41st House District in Aurora. My name Iman means faith in Arabic. I was born on the 17th day of the lunar calendar in the holy month of Ramadan. So in that spirit, they named me Faith to honor the month. I think it was important for my parents, being immigrants and refugees from a place in the world that still has apartheid and oppression and occupation, that the names of their children reflected their heritage, their lineage, and their religion. And they did just that, and it was reflected through the names of all of their children. My parents came to the United States almost 50 years ago in search of their own American dream. They are Palestinian immigrants and refugees born in the Holy Land, and with hard work and determination, they realize that American dream. Utilizing our ability, like my mom did, being a translator for uh, Denver Public Schools, or my father founding the largest and oldest mosque in the Rocky Mountain region, being small business owners, uh, giving lectures and, and speeches to colleges and schools and professionals, law enforcement, about cultural competency around probably one of the most misunderstood regions of the world and the people that call it home. You know, he was my best friend, so that's why this is a little difficult. <sighs> you know, I just, I wish he was here to see it. You know, both of them. Uh, their sacrifices, their hard work. Um, he was the first to go to college. And growing up the way that they both did, you know, I think about sitting in that hall. He used to give the um, opening prayer in the house. And, um, and now I'm sitting there. In many Arab countries, it's very traditional for the children's middle name to be their father's first name. And that is a beautiful way to honor lineage and heritage and tradition. And for me, I thought that that would be a great way to honor my own parents. And so making his middle initial in my official nameplate on the house floor was an homage to him and the sacrifices that both of my parents made for their children. His first name was Muhammad. Be proud of the name that you carry because your parents gave you that name as a reflection of their own values. And remember what we carry in our names. There's a history behind that name. There's a meaning behind that name. Be proud of that meaning. Assalamu alaikum, ismi Iman Judah. Someone's name is their identity, and often, for many black professionals, the pressure to assimilate to what they're told are universally acceptable names forces some people to change them. Earlier this year, one woman reclaimed her given name and shared her story with us. My parents did not give me the name Nita. My parents gave me the name Dwinita, D-W-I-N-I-T-A. When I started my career, my very first boss sat me down in her office and she said, you are smart, you are full of potential, and your name is not going to work. Your name is not going to work. And she said to me, the world will judge you by your name, they will stereotype what it is, they will identify who you are before you ever walk in a room. That was my introduction to my professional career. But it didn't take me long in corporate America to realize that there really were disparities that happened based on one, the color of your skin, but also based on people's names. And that's how I went from Dwinita to Nita. I cowered to what made it easier for other people, and I didn't think about myself, my family, 
and what my name might represent for them. I broke my mother's heart when I started using the name Nita. My mother died in 2019, and I was on the phone with her when she took her last breath. And when she did, she said, I love you, Dwanita. And now I know what I need to do with my name. I'm going to reclaim it. I know every time there's a sanitized name that there also is a broken heart associated with it. I want to end the heartbreak in my own life and I want to inspire others to end the heartbreak in their own lives and to be who you were commissioned to be through the name that you were given. The reason that I changed my name was to accommodate everybody else. I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do what I need to do and what I want to do and what my parents expected of me. That's what I'm doing. And I want to reclaim it in a big way and I want to go from Nita to Dwanita, and that's my plan. I am Dwanita Mosby Tyler. I'm coming back. Both of those stories were brought to us through the lens of Nine News photojournalist Jason Vaz. There's definitely that well, where do we fit in, <laughs> you know? First generation Latinos in Colorado share their experiences living with two cultures and an update on efforts to share the history of Denver's Chinese communities. As a first-generation Latino in the United States can be a unique and challenging experience. Over Hispanic Heritage Month this year, first-gen Latinos and Latinas in Colorado shared their experiences with Nine News reporter Victoria De Leon and producer Victoria Valenzuela. So I am Elva Parga. So I'm Alejandro Flores Muñoz. My name is Jacqueline Valenzuela. My name is Isela Costa. My name is Luis Fernandez. I'm a first gen student. Being the first I just graduated, uh, graduated from high school uh, means shouldering extra responsibility. Uh, there was always that pressure of uh, you have to finish school in order to do better than us, you know. I'm also the eldest of three, so um, there was always a lot of pressure. And usually it's all to make parents proud. They brought us to this country to do a lot better than them, right? That's something that we're reminded a lot. They always told me that if they had the opportunities I have, they would have been something bigger. They There's a balance between both cultures. Yeah, I think there would be times where I was just like, I realized that I was different. That like, isn't always school, easy like, to find. People over here uh, call you, oh, she's Mexican. People over there, oh, she's American. And it's like, well, yes, but no, <laughs> you know. Let's like, talk I about the phrase, ni de aquí, ni de allá. It means not from here or yeah, there. Basically, that means that you don't technically fit into traditional like Mexican like ideologies, but you also don't fit like the American standard. And this so, is a familiar feeling to some Hispanic and Latino students. Yeah, and sometimes it's a little bit embarrassing because I will forget, and this is bad, I'll forget like a Spanish word, right? Or I will forget how to translate something from even Spanish into English. Th there's definitely that well, where do we fit in, <laughs> you know? On top of finding where they fit in and pressure to do well in school, many have extra responsibilities at home. Most of these students are the oldest of other siblings. It's a pressure that you put on yourself because you know, uh, you know, younger people in your family are looking up, up to you. Yeah, ever since I was like 13, I remember just like picking them up from school and like walking to the house and then just like taking care of them while like, my parents got home and then it would just be like the same thing over and over again. I was tired. Education and family it are priorities always, uh, and so is being bilingual. Your English is very important to the household. Oh. The whole typical, oh, could you translate these papers for me or can you uh, go and translate for me at the doctor's office or, you know, Things like that, so. These students are balancing education, family responsibilities, and their Mexican-American cultures. So yeah, being the first comes with pressure, but it also comes with pride. Yeah, I'm very proud, yes. I am, yeah. I'm, I'm very proud and honored to be in the position that I'm, that I'm in. For these um, students, being the first in their families only means they won't be the last. Um, because I 
see it as an opportunity to learn, to gain that knowledge, and so I can pass it down to uh, my younger siblings and other family. I hope that as generations and myself continue to grow in this country, we're able to set a foundation for our people, our kids, you know, my, my sister, my future kids to come, and then just community itself. With producer Victoria Valenzuela, I'm Victoria De Leon. A Denver-based community group has been working all year long to re-envision Denver's historic Chinatown. All that's left of Denver's Chinatown in Lodo is a plaque that community members believe does not tell the full story of a once thriving Chinese community on Wazi Street. Colorado Asian Pacific United has unveiled a mock-up of an historical marker with new inscriptions focusing on the history of impactful Chinese immigrants in the community. The current plaque mostly focused on the riot itself. The group is now focused on raising funds for creating historical markers and murals. Coming up next, a look at how the Negro League helped shape Major League Baseball in Denver and the country. And after being left out of history books, students in Denver are now learning more about Colorado's Indian culture. This year, baseball fans in Denver got a chance to attend one of the biggest games in the major leagues when the All-Star Game came to the Mile High City. We couldn't highlight that exciting time in baseball without also recognizing its past. People of color weren't allowed to play in the major leagues until the middle of the 20th century. That's why the Negro Leagues were created. Jalisa Irizarry shows us how the league played a major role in breaking barriers right here in Denver. Let's hope I have all the colors. Being an artist takes serious commitment. All right. But even on the hottest day. Summertime, summertime. Just Diction's passion and persona Aha. never quits. Are you still on? No matter the heights, his work takes him. <laughs> I see what you did there. All right, all right. I used to play sports, so now full circle. I get to paint athletes and, you know, paint people that I thought I was going to be. You know what I mean? So. No complaints. <laughs> On the bricks of a Blake Street building. Okay, okay, okay. Dixon. Pledge Rodriguez. Paints five baseball greats. Tony Gwynn, Derek Jeter. Using shades this world could use more of. Oh, feels great. I mean, sure, it's part of my goal is to get more black people on walls. And it's, I mean, ever since last year, it's been a really, really a dedicated uh, thing for me. A dedication Dixon knows is crucial because to paint our present, we have to shed light on our past. But here's the Negro League World Series, the first one. The pictures that line the basement of Jay Sanford's yes. tell a crucial story. Yeah, it is. Uh, the Negro League was uh, really important. Uh, uh, Paul Parsons was the sports editor for the Denver Post, and he was in charge of the Post tournament. And Oliver Marcel, Oliver the Ghost Marcel, who is the greatest third baseman ever to play in the Negro Leagues. He was post-career and he was in Denver. And he went to Parsons and he suggested they bring the Monarchs in. So he invited them, they came, and that was the beginning of it. A black team playing a white team. More than a decade before. Uh, that would be 13 years. Jackie Robinson. 13 years. Made his debut. So it happened slowly, but it still happened. We broke that barrier, left the door open, and. Had that not happened in 1934, I'm convinced Jackie would not have broken the barrier in 1947. The black and whites of black and white capture an integral piece of history at that time. It was very important. Took real guts. Yeah, it did. Back on Blake Street, the National Ballpark Museum. Here's the R, here's the S. Wants to spotlight that bravery. But that's where Jackie made his major league debut. As museum curator, so go ahead, or Bruce Hellerstein okay. recognizes well, the challenges baseball players of color faced for decades. It's one of the saddest periods of this country, and that's why Jackie's breaking in was so significant. I tell people when they come into the museum that what we have here aren't the good old days, they're the great old days. But it took a while, but the great old days started when the black players were allowed to play. While Hellerstein and, um, is slowly collecting pieces of Negro League history, like the rest of our racial issues. That goes without question. We got a lot to do, but I'd like to think baseball is at the forefront of these things. 
Let's get it going. But ask Dixon, and he'll give you a whole different perspective. <laughs> he knows while these painted bases commemorate big strides, it's a work in progress. I think we all need to do better. <laughs> it's, it's not over. This is just a lot of people have been woke, have woken up to it, but doesn't mean that they are okay with it or they get they fully understand it. I still get the craziest questions when it says, at the end of the day, we all got to educate ourselves. We just need more, we need more representation. Like this project, Dixon knows racial equity won't happen overnight. Summertime, summertime. But committing to the cause is the first step to a new and inclusive picture. That artist, Just Dixon, painted that mural right across the street from Coors Field at the corner of 21st and Blake. It includes the faces of five greats, Yvonne Rodriguez, Derek Jeter, Tony Gwynn, Cal Ripken Jr., and Larry Walker. A new curriculum is teaching Denver students about often ignored history about LGBTQ plus leaders. This year, the history of Colorado's Indian boarding schools came to the forefront after hundreds of bodies were discovered in a mass grave at an indigenous boarding school in Canada. Colorado has at least three of those schools that were created to erase children's native culture and assimilate them to a different one. Nine News reporter Katie Eastman shows us the generation that survived those schools giving birth to one now fighting to reclaim their culture. Reclaiming something that was taken away is never the easy choice, but one Denver school chooses to do it every day. You know, it's funny, we don't really do a lot around Native American Heritage Month at our school. There's really no need. They celebrate year round at the American Indian Academy of Denver. The students call her Dr. B, but Terry speaks her name in her native language, Ojibwe because even though she's not fluent, there is power in words that her family was told not to say. The biggest thing to me when I think about our languages are really that it's, it's, it's the representation of our holistic worldview and um, that interconnectedness. When the charter school opened in 2020, the double eyes they became the only public school in Colorado to teach Navajo, or Diné, as a language. Hogoshi. Tony Crank has a music degree, but because he grew up speaking Diné on a reservation in Utah, the school needed him in this classroom. And I don't want to be the only one speaking it when, when I leave. 14-year-old Rose Leba is Diné on her mother's side, but her family hid their culture. It wasn't normal, I guess, to the rest of the society for them to be who they really were, like to embrace their culture. That's why Dr. B started this school. So my mom is a boarding school survivor. Uh, she went, she started boarding school in when she was six years old. Um, she lost her language at that boarding school and uh, was really indoctrinated into Catholicism and just mainstream, you know, society. The generation before her was taught to live in shame. Eh? She's teaching the next one. Eh? to celebrate. Recently, we indigenous people have came into a community after so long being told um, we can't, yeah. we can't do, we can't be ourselves. We can't learn our traditional ways that our ancestors learned. We can't do any of that, but here it's- Nice to meet you. We can do that. All right, can everybody hear me? They are carrying on the tradition of poop dancing. Really since I was 18 years old. A lot of my life's passion has been on reclaiming our culture, reclaiming that beauty that was once ours, that pride. Education was used to destroy her culture, but this education hopes to heal it. Woo! Dr. B says Denver was one of the original four relocation cities back in the 1950s and 60s, part of a federal program that incentivized people to move off reservations and into urban areas. That's one of the reasons she says there are 200 tribes represented in the metro area.
they wanted to feel represented in the classroom. And that's when it dawned on me, like, we're not doing enough for the LGBTQ plus community, especially in middle school. There are pieces of history missing from our school textbooks, but there's a teacher in the Denver metro area working to fill in the blanks. Strive Prep Sunnyside social studies teacher Wendy Gutierrez has been teaching LGBTQ lessons in her world studies class for two semesters now. She says by and large, she's received positive feedback about the lessons. We've had a uh, mom in particular who said that it, this is great because it's something she never learned about growing up and she's thankful that her son is able to learn about it today. I think more schools should teach their kids to like the LGBTQ. They deserve that recognition as much as straight men and women. Gutierrez built these lesson plans with the help of LGBTQ plus historian David Duffield with the Center on Colfax. Duffield used to be a teacher for Strive Prep. The two are working on a free website where teachers across the country can access the lesson plans they've created. We want to thank you again for joining us for this Voices of Change holiday special.